Welcome to Season 4 of E-Commerce Fastlane. This podcast helps resilient entrepreneurs thrive with Shopify. And now, on to Episode 215. You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. You know something? Accidents can happen to your Shopify store. Maybe you installed an app and it messed up your theme or a store collaborator deleted product images by mistake. The common myth is that Shopify has a backup that you can use when something goes wrong. The truth is they don't. So what do you do? You use Rewind to protect your store with automated backups. The Rewind app should be the first thing you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, or even collaborators gone bad. It's honestly like having your very own magic undo button. And it's trusted by over 100,000 businesses from side hustles to the biggest online retailers like Gatorade and Movement Watches. It's even a Shopify Plus certified app partner, which means it has the reliability, security, and privacy you need to protect your brand. Install the Rewind app today and respond to any of their welcome emails and mention the e-commerce Fastlane podcast and you'll get your first month absolutely free. Enjoy peace of mind with Rewind Backups. Find it in the Shopify App Store or by visiting rewind.com. Well, hey there, it's Steve, and welcome back to the e-commerce Fast Lane podcast. Now, if this is your first time listening, this is an e-commerce show where we have honest and transparent conversations about building and thriving with your store powered by Shopify or Shopify Plus. If you're an ambitious, lifelong learner, you're definitely in the right place today. Now, new episodes are available twice weekly with your favorite podcast players like Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and many more. And they're all available at eCommerce Fastlane. Very relevant back catalog is there, and you can stream them at eCommerce Fastlane. Now, in today's episode, my guest is Chris, who's the CEO and co-founder of a company called LinkBee. That's L-I-N-K-B-Y, LinkBee.com. And they're a platform, and what they do is they help direct-to-consumer brands to get more editorial coverage. And a lot of these premium you know, locations, think like Forbes Shopping and Bustle and Daily Mail and so many other publications. I'm going to dig into it. I know he's been growing this business. We're actually recording. I'm in Canada, in British Columbia and Vancouver, and it's six o'clock in the morning for my guest today, who's coming from Sydney, Australia. So welcome, Chris, to e-commerce Fastlane. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity of recording this today. I know being so early in the morning, but you know, that's the, I guess the benefits of, you know, where there's talent and technology It's nice to get us both together today. And let's record this content because I believe there's some opportunities for a lot of Shopify brands who can get value out of the kind of services that you offer through LinkBee. 100%. I think it's remarkable when you look at Shopify being built out of Canada and our ability now, especially with everything that's happening in the world at the moment with this global pandemic, to be able to grow and start a business and work with clients in anywhere that they may be in the globe. It's a really beautiful thing. It is wild. So you heard me mention what LinkBee does a little bit at the top of the show, but I think it's always best kind of in the founder's own words. So what does LinkBee do and what sort of problems are you solving for Shopify store owners? Yeah, sure thing. So very simply, I suppose our goal is to make brands famous. So when we say that, what we mean is that we help brands of any size get more editorial coverage across some of the biggest digital publishing brands in the world. So that includes brands like Forbes Shopping, Daily Mail, Bustle, I mean, a whole heap more across not just the US, but also the UK and Australia and soon to kind of expand into other international markets as well. And so we do this by creating a cost per click advertising campaign between your brand and the publisher. So you only pay for the successful clicks back to your store. 
And we've helped brands drive return on investment off the back of these campaigns as high as 953%, while also driving all those other benefits that come with that editorial coverage, such as building your brand, developing trust, and getting you featured alongside some of the biggest brands in the world. I'd also add, I can imagine their SEO value of having a link from a premium publisher, their domain authority and credibility from in Google, in Google's eyes, and then having some editorial content published on there, that is going to be like an ever- evergreen piece of content that literally would, I guess, transfer a lot of that, I'm going to call it link juice back to your Shopify store. Yeah, I don't think anyone quite knows for certain exactly how the Google algorithm works and whatnot. And I think because it's commercial content, a lot of the major brands do use like do not follow links, but you still have your brand being mentioned across these huge publishing brands and link back to your site directly and generating traffic through that way. And and one of the beautiful things as well is that often some of the most successful results have come from introducing your brand to a whole lot of new customers. And so that's one thing about Linkby is that it's a really great way to make sure that you're not just continually marketing to people that you're retargeting, for instance, and you know where you're sort of hitting the same consumers over and over again through the same platforms. It's really a great way to cast your net a bit wider and bring people into the top of the funnel through a platform that can also convert for you as well. Net new visitors. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, this is great. So let's talk a little bit about your journey because it always, it just fascinates me why people build what they build. And I believe it's there's a lot more than just, hey, I'm looking for some recurring revenue or I think the business model really goes along with the journey of the people that actually built the product and it just kind of, usually there's an aha moment <laughs> usually. So I'd love if you could share with the audience today, like kind of what uniquely positions you and your co-founder, I guess, on a couple different points. Like number one, to have the desire to even want to build a platform like this. And then where did the expertise come? Because obviously you've been wildly successful through Australia and now expanding massively into North America now. So just would like to understand that whole journey. Of course. Well, I like to kind of feel as if my whole career has been sort of building me up to create this business and this company. So 16 years ago, I co-founded my previous business, which definitely in Australia, I'm probably most known for. It's a youth-focused publishing brand called Pedestrian, and it grew to become Australia's largest independently founded media brand. So we ultimately ended up selling that business to the largest media company in Australia called Channel 9. And to give you an idea of the scale of Pedestrian now in Australia, it's the only only market in the world where Vice and Refinery29 and kind of everything that goes along with Vice is operated under a license model and the licensee is pedestrian. So it's done extremely well in that youth-focused publishing space. And we were really fortunate and we kind of were sort of at the right place at the right time. We also worked very hard, but we built something that was really significant here. But as successful as sort of pedestrian was, one thing that I kept noticing that was that we often struggled to find scalable ways to work with small to medium-sized businesses, especially those in the e-commerce world. I had loads of friends who were running their own e-commerce stores who were desperate to work with us and would always say, Chris, how can we do something on pedestrian? But when I looked at their businesses and what they really needed, what they needed was sort of more agile, self-service style platforms, you know, that were kind of performance-based and you know, we're more similar essentially to kind of what they were doing on Google and Facebook. And that's what Linkby does. So we didn't have that offering at Pedestrian. And so when I started to look at my next chapter, that's what I really wanted to create. And so Linkby helps you unlock editorial coverage across over 170 now global publishing brands with a simple campaign flow and CPC focus that you're probably already familiar with. So if you've set up a marketing campaign in the past on one of those big platforms, then you should be able to jump onto Linkby and go through those steps really easily. And if not, we've got a team that can guide you through your first campaign as well. Very cool. I guess many people that are listening today, myself included, they're wondering, you know, if their brand or if they're vertical, if they can gain some traction from Linkby platform. I mean, you know, you have these partnerships with a lot of the mainstream publications. And so I think there is merit in that, but I'm wondering how do you choose a publication and then maybe walk us through a little bit about First, maybe on like the brands and categories that you've currently helped, I guess, gain some notable coverage. And then I think that might spark some conversation around, you know, can we cover all verticals or can we select certain publications based on the type of readership they have based on the vertical that you're involved in? So kind of a few questions kind of rolled into one there, but I'll kind of see where this unfolds. Yeah, of course. So we 
So you have some of the major publications that we're probably spending quite a bit of time talking about in this conversation, but at the same time, we do have quite a long tail of publications as well. The main criteria to be chosen as a publisher across the platform is that you're creating quality content that's of a premium nature and it's being featured, you know, and you've got a decent sized audience there. And so we have brands like entrepreneur.com, which is very much focused on, it has a bit more of a B2B focus. You're targeting kind of founders founders, startup owners, things like that. On the other hand, we've got the shopping component of a brand like TMZ, for instance. So it's really broad and wide. We do like to think that for most consumer-based products, we have the right home there of a brand. Um, And it may be a brand that the owner of the Shopify store hasn't heard about in the past potentially could be a brand that has a very strong loyal audience that is able to really move the needle for that brand or that founder. Right. And so I'm wondering about the different types of categories that are available, because I think when I think of Shopify, I mean, I don't know what the exact stats are, but I wouldn't be surprised if Shopify is half fashion, probably. And then there's so many other kind of categories. Have you found success in lots of different verticals or is it just nature of Shopify that a lot of them are fashion related brands that are doing well? Uh, No, it's across the board, really. So, you know, we've run campaigns for really large D2C brands, including the likes of Allbirds, Article, 30 Madison, Wink. But we've also helped loads of much smaller brands, including kind of solo founders on Shopify, get coverage that previously they weren't able to lock in and wasn't possible for them to get access to. So, yeah, we've held brands in categories. Obviously, you know, fashion is a big one, as you mentioned, but beauty's been really, really strong. Homewares, any type of CPG goods have been really, really strong as well. And that's also a category where often the, the sale price can be a bit low. Lower. And so, you know, this kind of cost per click model does work quite well to get coverage because it's a category that sometimes the commercial teams of these sort of digital publishers that we work with haven't gravitated towards categories with lower price points as much. Then health-based products, as well as like a whole range of sort of subscription box-based companies as well. And we've also helped smaller brands start to look at some of their first international coverage as well. So as brands start looking to ship or scale into markets like the UK or Australia, you know, we can help to build some of that first press in kind of markets like that as well. I've noticed a lot of the publications, these are a lot of the ones that we all know of when I think of people, I'm just looking at your website, like Better Homes and Gardens, um, In Style. Uh, I mean, you mentioned TMZ, but there's other big ones out there too. Even like BuzzFeed, like the global BuzzFeed opportunity. You've got some serious cloud here and some serious access to a lot of these, like for sure they're big in North America, but literally you have this, the world's your oyster as far as English speaking publications. Like it's, that's unbelievable. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, it's, we've been pretty busy. We still feel like we've got a long way to go. And, you know, we've got a lot of conversations and a lot of more big publishers, hopefully about to drop into the site, especially across North America. But yeah, you know, we're thrilled to have Meredith join, who obviously, as you sort of mentioned, publish People and Better Homes and Gardens and InStyle. And so we're working with them at the moment to get some of the first brands that they're going to be featuring, you know, getting them samples and getting the editors across those products. We've also got brands like Insider, Pure Wow, the Hearst brands as well. So we've got the newspaper component of the Hearst brands in North America. And then we've got the magazine side of the business in the UK. And hopefully, you know, down the track, we'll have the magazine side of the business in the US as well. You know, we have like kind of men's focus sites like Uncrate and Cool Material. We have Entrepreneur, as I was saying before, which helps give you access to that kind of startup, kind of founder sort of community. The Inventory, which is very product focused, published by the team at Geo Media, as well as the portfolio brands under the bustle arm. So we do a lot of work with the newsletters of like the Zoe Report and as you mentioned, BuzzFeed globally. So yeah, it's a huge focus of us to kind of just keep growing that publisher pool and giving advertisers and Shopify owners more and more choice in terms of where they can hopefully have their content displayed and published. Right. So let's suppose that a brand listening today, you know, likes the idea of getting this coverage and they understand it's a cost per click kind of model. They get it and it's going to help them drive some net new visitors. Can you kind of walk us through a little bit about what the campaign flow looks like? Because it truly is a campaign. There's some content that needs to be written. Um, It needs to be compelling and educational, maybe entertaining and talking about, you know, what it is that you sell or a product launch or whatever it is. And then when you have this content produced, then I guess it goes into your system. As a founder of a direct-to-consumer company, like what are the typical costs now based on I have content produced telling a story and educating or entertaining the market about something? And then what's the financial portion of getting this reach that's required? 
Yeah, of course. So first of all, you simply head to linkby.com. So as you said at the start of the show, that's L-I-N-K-B-Y.com. You would just either request a demo, which is a great way to start because that means that you can chat to one of our team. We've got a team based in North America, so you can talk to someone in your own time zone. You don't have to wake up at 6 a.m. like I have today. <laughs> it's, it's really straightforward. And yeah, you set up an account. From there, you can set up a campaign in just two minutes. So the platform essentially kind of guides you through the steps to create what by the end of it is almost like a simple press release. So if you have written a press release before, great. If you haven't, don't stress. It's very, very simple. It's essentially just a kind of a briefing form for the publisher so that they know everything that they need to know about your brand, but also about what it is that you would ideally like them to kind of write about. Brands use the platform to talk about a sale that they might be having, you know, kind of trying to get cut through around a sale period like Black Friday or Cyber Monday, or it could be a new product or a new initiative that you're launching or a new vertical. All of these things are things that we've helped Shopify founders with over the years. So you can then put in your campaign dates, very similar to kind of a Facebook campaign or something that you're running on Google or Instagram. You put the start and the end date in, you won't get charged for anything that happens outside of those campaign dates. We recommend a about a kind of three-month campaign to kind of give publishers the largest possible opportunity to be able to pick up the story, write it up, and then also have a decent amount of time to be able to kind of distribute it through all of their various channels, which gives you more coverage. You also upload your budget. So this budget acts as the absolute cap of what you will spend through the platform. So you will not spend more than that amount of money and your CPC. So in Linkby at the moment, you choose your CPC. There is a minimum CPC. And when I say CPC, that's cost per click of of $1 US and a recommended level of $1.50 US. So then when you choose to work with a publisher, you have to set an allocated budget to that publisher. So it's essentially from your larger budget, how am I splitting that up to, to publishers? Most publishers have allocated budgets of $2,500 to $5,000 across the US, which acts as your budget cap with the publisher. So again, it basically acts as your ceiling where you will not pay more than that. And you're only charged for the clicks from dollar number one. So if a publisher only drives 50 clicks for you and you're paying a $1.50 CPC, then you'll only be charged $75. But if that publisher drives 2 million clicks for you and they've got a 2,500 budget cap, you'll only be charged $2,500. So you only get charged for the clicks that you drive up to your maximum budget cap. So you know the most you'll have to pay and you'll only charge what's actually delivered. So there's no kind of fixed fee component to the costs at all. One follow-up question I have, and it's probably not related to the Linkby product, but a lot of these uh, publishers are physical print publishers also, and or are available in PDF format and through e-readers and all these different things. So what happens in that particular kind of case where InStyle has a physical magazine that comes out every single month with editorial content in it? Are those all written by in-house people that belong to InStyle and they're not really taking any advertorials or any kind of PR type pieces in those print publications versus what the online version has a wider depth of content available that's measurable through a CPC model. Yeah, it's an interesting point. At this stage, the digital teams and the print teams do tend to work quite separately with a lot of these publications. And so what brands are doing digitally often may not ever appear in the print component of the magazine or newspaper, for instance. We've been very focused on the digital component. That said, there is this interesting moment happening, I think, in the world at the moment with QR codes and people getting better at, I suppose, going from printed or kind of um, barcode QR code style in environments into digital. And so it is something that we've started to at a, at a very early stage of looking at is, is saying, can we take this model to kind of like a print environment as well? It may seem like a strange thing to do in 2021 to be looking at how you can go from digital to print because digital is pretty sweet, <laughs> you know, in terms of kind of having like very low limits to kind of scalability. But it is definitely something that we think is interesting. And you know, I think for these publications, I mean, I'm a absolute sort of publishing nerd. And, you know, kind of my first ever job was at a kind of a news agent, which I'm not even sure if you have that term in the kind of the US or Canada, maybe it's like similar to like a newsstand where like I would sell magazines and things like that. And that's back when I was 
you know, kind of 15 years old. So I've always been surrounded by these publications and mastheads and print products. And I love it all, like, you know, any type of kind of content, wherever it is. And so anything we can do to sort of help small to medium sized businesses better connect with publishers, I think is a good thing. So it's, it's definitely something that's on our radar. But at the moment, it's predominantly across the digital component of these publications. And that's where you're getting the value. You know, I've saw recently more of a side note, but I've seen a lot of QR codes. Some are being inserted in like thank you cards inside boxes from direct to consumer brands. And that QR code is then redirecting to getting a review or getting involved in the loyalty programs and stuff like that. So it's kind of an interesting engagement way of a physical thing that you need to do with your phone. Also notice a lot kind of off topic a bit too, but even in restaurants and stuff, they don't want to bring out a printed menu. <laughs> they just have the QR code on the table that you kind of scan. They saying, are you okay with the digital menu? Instead of the, the one in your hand. <laughs> and so we always kind of take a quick snapshot of that and boom. So it seems that more and more people are getting used to the QR code kind of opportunity. It's available. And I have seen it in print magazines and stuff just to direct to a more engaging kind of online presence and or landing page and lead capture and all the things that go along with getting out of print and getting into the digital realm. Yeah, definitely. It's it's definitely changed over the last couple of years. I think when people first started putting codes into kind of print products, people thought that that was a bit crazy. You know, like it's like, oh, well, no one's going to click on, no one's going to do that. Whereas now you kind of go, well, 100% of people almost know how that thing works. And so therefore, if they want to find out more, they probably will find out more. So yeah. I've even seen physical packages now too, like actual goods with a QR code on them, like the outside packaging. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so it's so interesting kind of where it's headed. So let's kind of pivot a bit over to some, to a story, hopefully. I tried to prep you before this call to say, hey, you know, can you find one particular kind of impactful story that you feel could tell the, and set the stage and tell the right story around, hey, they needed access to, you know, more top of funnel, more awareness and consideration for their product. And I know they're in the direct to consumer space and the consumable space. And so I'm going to leave it up to you to kind of share how you met this company and kind of just the whole process of went through and how do they onboard and just nice to share what success looks like on the LinkB platform today. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's one of the biggest thrills for me is working with companies that are run by friends or just companies that are run by first time founders or young founders and seeing them get these amazing results off the back of the platform. There's been a lot like, you know, where people have said, wow, this is outperforming my Facebook ads or this is getting this coverage has helped me get stocked in this major retailer or, you know, like there's so much that these getting this nod from this premium mastheads can drive and, you know, and whatnot. But one story that really stands out, it was actually quite early in our journey. And so it was exciting personally because it was a real validation of what we were doing as much as it, it drove great results for the founder involved. And so, you know, kind of one of those early customers, you know, they were a sustainable coffee pod company called Tripod Coffee. So first of all, you know, they, they were not just selling a product, but they were selling a product that had a really strong, sustainable angle to it. They had these coffee pods that were actually kind of compostable and they wanted to try to rid the world of these like one use coffee pods. And I thought that that was a mission that was really strong. And, you know, the product was fantastic. But, you know, like with any small business, as good as your product can be, you're still up against much bigger players in that market who can always outspend you, who are much more likely to get picked up by major publications. So yeah, David, one of the founders of that business, he discovered us via a Slack channel of D2C marketers that were sort of talking about LinkBee and their strategies around that. And they, yeah, they ran their first campaign, which was a big deal for them, you know, like they were a tiny team and, you know, kind of every marketing dollar needed to perform. And I guess because of the way we work with publishers, we do have these budget caps in there, which I think sometimes can be a little bit daunting to brands, but they took the leap. They realized the power that one or two really strong articles could drive in that early stage of their business. And yeah, they pitched to a handful of publishers and very luckily they got the campaign picked up by David's first choice, which was a website in Australia called Broadsheet. Interestingly, getting a Broadsheet feature in Australia is huge. There's actually this term, it's called getting broad chat. Basically, what that means is getting featured across this site sometimes leads companies to get so much new traffic and business that it actually kind of sometimes causes issues for them because there's too much demand for their products. And so they're really lucky to get featured across this site, all facilitated via the LinkBee platform. And Broadsheet was a publication that's hard to get into, you know, they're picky about who they write. Getting coverage has led to huge outcomes for brands and 
you know, usually you would need to either spend thousands of dollars on a marketing campaign or have a fancy PR agency, both of which are out of the reach of someone like David, who is the founder of Tripod. So when Tripod locked their story in, they were beyond excited just to have that feature. But then the content ended up actually driving such huge volumes of sales that it led to Tripod's like largest ever day of sales in their history by quite a large margin. And we see this all the time with brands. Like, you know, we had a brand in the UK recently where like we sold out their Amazon store from a feature that they had across one of the major like UK independent stores. And yeah, it's just, it's just sort of thrilling to see, you know, kind of hear from founders who are getting these results off of the platform. That often comes out of this really exciting moment, which is that value validation for their business, which is getting secured and featured across some of these large publications that previously they probably never thought they would have access to, while obviously driving return on ad spend and driving all of the other benefits that go along with being featured across those publications. Right. Well, this is really great. Thanks so much for sharing that. I'll make sure that I have a link to that in the show notes. I just was actually looking at that company, a Tripod Coffee, while you were talking about it. And so they are a Shopify store and they're doing their thing and they're growing and scaling. And, and so it's so interesting that you were part of their early journey and it's pretty exciting. So let's just talk a little bit about the people that are listening to this episode, because what's interesting is just, you know, 10,000 or so are viewing this or listening to this right now, but they're going to be in different parts of their entrepreneurial journey. Some are kind of in early stage, just thinking about maybe wanting to launch a Shopify store. Some are further along their journey. Some are going to be on the Shopify plus side. And so they are really starting to grow and scale. But just from your perspective, because you deal with lots of entrepreneurial people and you're helping with production of getting articles out and getting more coverage and you see what success is, is there anything specific or advice that you could give? I know it's more general advice because we have all different types of complexities and maturities of entrepreneurs that are listening today. But nice just to hear it from your perspective, what you believe people should be working on right now to help grow and scale. Yeah, definitely. I think probably the first thing, and, and this is just a tip I would give to kind of almost any entrepreneur is don't discount yourself from any opportunity because you see yourself as being too small for it. If you're ambitious and you act like a much bigger company than you are, then the beauty of Shopify is that it's got this huge ability to level the playing field, right? So you can have access to world-class e-commerce tools that are as strong and as powerful as some of the biggest players in the market. And so I think, you know, you want to kind of treat your brand with the same respect and the way you present it. We do find that the difference sometimes between brands getting, you know, really strong pickup from publishers and maybe not so much is quality kind of design across the mastheads and 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 just brands that are trying to look like a premium brand across these platforms. And that can make a huge difference, you know, from something that where people go, oh, well, we're just small. So we're just going to look like a small store. And I think that's one of our passions at LinkBee. It's helping kind of small and medium sized businesses really like act like industry leaders and, you know, get editorial coverage and features from some of the biggest names in publishing coverage that typically went to much bigger brands that have staff in the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and whatnot. Yeah, as I sort of said in that previous example, I think, you know, the biggest buzz for us is helping entrepreneurs and companies that are emerging get cut through and coverage that they previously were unable to that then drives really strong results for them. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. So what does the future look like for LinkB? Are you able to share maybe what your North Star is? I know that, you know, we've not maxed out Australia and UK, but, you know, your journey started there. And here we are now in the US. Are you able to, just end of the day, I'm just trying to understand more about how you're going to continue to iterate on your platform and just offer more value. You have lots of publications, but just what's the future going to look like? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, we're continuing to have more and more conversations with more more publications. So the goal is to really significantly expand our publishing pool, especially across the US. So that's going to be something that you're going to see if you are on the platform, you'll see over the coming months that there'll be more and more big names joining the platform. We're also currently testing out some new products that will add even further scale to kind of what we're doing and but still really tightly connected to our mission to help revolutionize the way that brands and publishers connect. And we'll also start to probably quite later in this year, start to look at other international markets to expand into as well. So we're looking at other European markets as well as doing work across Asia as well. So for us, it's with every market we've been into so far has been a success and there's definitely huge demand for this product. When I talk to global teams that speak directly to brands, they always say, I've never had so much positivity around a product, which is cool. So it definitely doesn't feel like you're kind of selling anything. It feels it's like you're really solving a problem, which is what we try to do. So yeah, so I'd say growing and expanding the publishing pool, building some new products that help to just add a bit more scale to the offering, then yeah, kind of further internationalization is what the real focus is. 
Perfect. So Chris, we are nearing the end of the show for today, but do you have any uh, insights or any takeaways that you would like to leave with our listeners today? So yeah, I'd say that making your brand famous is one of the biggest challenges for any D2C brand and it has positive flow and effects to everything else that you do. And that's exactly what Linkby is trying to help do for brands all over the world. We want to increase their brand fame by helping them connect and secure editorial coverage from premium digital publishing brands. So the likes of Forbes Shopping, Daily Mail and Bustle. Our cost per click offering makes it easier than ever before to kind of scale your editorial coverage as you only pay for the clicks back to your site. Editorial plays like these, they deliver readers content and also context around your brand. So when they click through, they're more likely to convert. And we've been really lucky to be able to help work with brands deliver return on ad spend as high as 953%. And all of this has led to Linkby becoming one of the secret weapons of some of the most effective D2C brands around the world. Wow, that's awesome. So how can people learn more about your solution? Where, where can they go to get more details? Yeah, if, if you'd like to find out more, simply visit linkby.com. So that's L-I-N-K-B-Y.com. And you can set up a free demo, chat to one of the team and yeah, find out how we can help make your brand famous and get you some more editorial coverage across premium publishers around the world. Now, we did speak offline before recording today. I understand that you would like to share an offer for those listening today. Yeah, of course. So one of the things that I think sometimes brands find a little bit daunting about Linkby is that, as I sort of said, went through the campaign creation tool, we sort of help people set up a press release and find that way to talk about the brand and find that hook or that angle to really get someone, get an editor excited about what it is that they're seeing when it's being pitched to them. And it's definitely a bit of an art form. And it's something that just having run campaigns now for thousands of clients clients and to a variety of publishers all over the world, we've become really, really great at. And we actually have a creative services team in-house that specifically works with some of our largest brands to help them continually find angles and fine tune their offerings. This creative services team is part of our managed services component of what we offer, which is, again, usually only accessible to kind of larger brands because it involves ongoing fixed fees and things like that. But for you know, e-commerce fast lane listeners, we've got a really, really great offer, which is that if you set up a demo and just mention to our account manager who you speak to that you found out about us through e-commerce fast lane, then we'll be happy to give you access to those creative services for free for, for absolutely no cost. So it's usually something that would cost brands to have our team help them fine tune their angles, their press releases, their editorial pitches, and you know identify those strongest hooks available to gain the best pickup from publishers. So yeah, so as a said, you can get access to our creative services team for absolutely nothing. If you have listened to this podcast, set up a demo on the site. And yeah, we'll be more than happy to give you access to that. Because, you know, it, it is something that we're trying, we're working hard to be able to do is to help any brand, no matter their size, get more coverage and cut through. And, you know, yeah, like our creative services team are absolute guns at being able to find that angle and that secret source for a brand to be able to stand out amongst a very crowded environment when it comes to, you know, editors and the choice that they have of brands that they can write about. One nice thing too is I'll make sure that I have the link to the sign up form and some of the details, I guess, like further details on this creative services. I think it's an amazing offer and I want to thank you for that. I'll have it redirect from ecommercefastlane.com forward slash link B and that will redirect you to this particular landing page, which will have the details of how you can get a demo just to see the platform, sign up for it, and then think about the campaign that you want to build and then have one of the team members through the Link B creative team to kind of help just, you're right, just structure it in the best possible way. I think there's, it's an art and a little bit of a science around it. And I think you've kind of fine tuned that over thousands of some projects that you've been working on. So I just wanted to appreciate you for offering that to our listeners today. So take Chris up and his team up on that offer. I mean, really go check out linkb.com and take a look and see what they have or go to that landing page. It'll all be in the show notes and stuff like that. So you can find out more details. I think it's another angle, another way of just helping drive net new visitors. I always talk about how do we acquire, how do we get more awareness and consideration for your brand? And so of maybe spending it just all on Facebook or Google or other different types of social channels and stuff like that. There's lots of channels out there. This is another interesting channel that's not been maximized, I believe, by a lot of brands, but there's wild success, mostly for the larger brands, but you're kind of bringing it downstream. I just wanted to appreciate you that thank you for building this platform and thanks for, you know, really pushing hard in the North American market. Once again, I just appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your vision and really helping to give back to the Shopify ecosystem. 
No, thanks so much, Steve. Thanks so much for your time. And it's such an amazing opportunity to be delivered into the earphones and earbuds of all of these amazing Shopify founders. I think as a Shopify shareholder, <laughs> pretty amazing seeing such an amazing business form that's given so many people around the world such huge opportunities. And yeah, like as I said, it. I think <laughs> we haven't actually pulled the data. I would hazard a guess that probably more than probably 60 or 70% of our clients are probably on Shopify. So it presents a huge part of our ecosystem as well. And yeah, anything we can do to help please just reach out. All right, sounds good. Time for you to have a coffee and time for us to say goodbye. (laughs) Have yourself a good morning. Thanks, Dave. Now, this episode was brought to you by the team at Rewind. The common myth is that Shopify has a backup that you can use when something goes wrong with your store. The truth is they don't. So what do you do? You use Rewind to protect your store with automated backups. The Rewind app should be the first thing you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, or even collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. It's trusted by over 100,000 businesses, large and small. So enjoy peace of mind and install the Rewind app today. And make sure to respond to any of their welcome emails and mention the e-commerce Fastlane podcast and you'll get your first month absolutely free. Learn more by checking out Rewind in the Shopify app store or by visiting rewind.com. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you, a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, launch, grow, and scale with Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.